are. This case review is of a really interesting transport that happened not too long ago, and it's an emergency interfacility transport. Now, you newbies out there like to think that 911 is where all the glory is, and that's where the heroes are born, and that's fine if you think that those things are exciting. The truth is, though, the longer you're at this, the more you're going to realize that it's the emergency interfacility transports that have the higher chance of interesting stuff happening. And the reason why is because 911 is mostly routine. It's stub toes, I just don't feel good. That's the overwhelming majority of 911 calls. But when it comes to the emergency interfacility transport, this is a patient that the current hospital has said, this one's beyond my ability to treat. We need to send this patient somewhere else that has more expertise, more capabilities. And therefore, those are the patients that need to be watched more carefully, and they're frequently a higher acuity patient. In particular, this call has a point in which the paramedic needs to make some quick decisions and decide whether or not to intervene. If you are not a paramedic, please don't tune out. I promise you, I am speaking to all levels of license here. This is an emergency interfacility transport of a 71-year-old female. She wakes up and she does not feel well. She's nauseous and she just doesn't feel right, so she goes to the hospital. At 6 a.m., she walks in that front door and says, I don't feel good, I've been vomiting for hours. And they bring her in, put her in a bed, and they start doing a workup for this nausea vomiting case. They do get a 12 lead, they do put her on cardiac monitoring, and somewhere over the course of that morning, they start to see some EKG changes. Her troponin comes back at 0.87, and she starts to develop a STEMI. This is the 12 lead that our paramedic took when they arrived at the emergency department to pick the patient up and take her to the next hospital. In this EKG, we definitely have an inferior STEMI happening. You see right here in leads 2, 3, and AVF, there is ST elevation. This is a printout of the Philips Tempest cardiac monitor 12 lead. So they also provide the STJ segment measurements. So as I said, 2, 3, and AVF, we have elevation. We look over here on the right, and you can see in 2, we have 2.06 millimeters of elevation, and 3, 0.66 millimeters, and in AVF, 1.37 millimeters of ST elevation. So you have to have one millimeter or more ST elevation in two contiguous leads, and leads two and AVF are considered contiguous, so this counts as a STEMI. But even more important, if you take a look over here in some of the precordial leads, V1 through V6, right here, all have ST depression. You have ST elevation in one part of the heart, ST depression in another part of the heart. This is a true STEMI. But what about down here in the interpretation, or what I like to call the doc in a box? Why doesn't it say STEMI anywhere in there? Well, if you look, it says possible arm lead reversal, so only AVF and V1 through V6 are being analyzed. So because the computer doesn't see exactly what it expects to see, it's saying, nope, we're not going to interpret. We're just going to put them out here for you. You're trained in how to interpret this. Draw your own conclusions. And this is why Doc in a Box is not the most reliable source of information. Let's take a quick peek at what has been done for this patient prior to our arrival. Uh, and you see here we have ondansetron given twice. That is an anti-nausea medication. And then we see they also tried metoclopramide and compazine. So they are really working on this woman's nausea. You can look right here at the vital signs throughout the transport. And you'll see that most of the blood pressures were a little elevated. But at one point, the blood pressure dropped to 90 over 62. Why did that happen? I'm about to show you. Here we are bouncing down the road in the back of the ambulance, monitoring lead two on our STEMI patient that is going lights and sirens to the cath lab. And as we're monitoring, suddenly 
we see this tachycardic rhythm has a change. And we're about to enter what paramedics call a pucker moment. We have this ventricular standstill or no ventricular activity, and now we're in a very bradycardic rhythm, very slow heart rate. And there's a lot of artifact or little jigglies on the bottom. There goes the extreme bradycardia alarm. So if you weren't paying attention to the monitor, now the monitor has gotten your attention and you notice this rhythm change and you're seeing all of this artifact or squiggly baseline here. What is going on with this patient? Paramedic has to make a decision. Am I going to intervene or am I not going to intervene? And while the paramedic is trying to decide, the rhythm starts to speed up again. We still have a lot of movement though. But the rhythm is getting faster and faster, and now we are back to the same tachycardic rhythm we had before, but with lots of wandering baseline, lots of patient movement, but we're pretty much back to where we started. So what happened to cause this pucker moment, this ventricular standstill, this, oh my God, my stomach patient just had a rhythm change, something happened, what am I going to do about it? Let's take a look at that same information, but this time we're going to look at all three fields that the Tempest LS lets us look at and replay after the fact. So the very top ECG line is lead one, the very bottom ECG line is lead two, and in the middle is the impedance or the electrical resistance measurement between the defibrillation pads that were put on the patient. When you're looking at the impedance or the electrical resistance, you can see patient movement, you can see respirations, and if we were doing CPR, you would be able to see the compressions that are being done too. We're going to start and watch and we have that same tachycardic rhythm. You can see the ST elevation in the bottom and it's all tachycardic at this point. And as we're driving down the road, you can see what's about to come. In the middle, you can see that the respirations are nice and regular and smooth. And then we get to the moment of pucker. And you notice the center line is moving quite a bit more. There's a lot of patient movement now. And we go into our bradycardic rhythm. Let's pause right here. Very interesting to compare the top ECG to the bottom ECG, and you can tell in the bottom it's a little bit more smooth. The artifact is not covering up the atrial activity, so you can still see P waves here, 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 and here. So we know that the sinus node is still firing and somehow the signal is not making it to the bottom of the heart as often and therefore you're not getting the ventricular contractions as frequently as the atrial signals are coming down. And in the middle you have all that patient movement. We're in this bradycardic rhythm, lots and lots of patient movement, very slow heart rate in this STEMI patient definitely still a pucker moment for the paramedic trying to decide what to do. So what is happening to cause this? You remember in the beginning when the patient came to the ER and she said, I have all of this nausea and vomiting and they gave her Zofran and then they gave her another dose of Zofran and they gave her metoclopramide and they gave her compazine. What happened is the patient started vomiting again. That's why you saw all of that movement in the impedance line and that's why you saw all of that bradycardia because when you vomit, you're stimulating the vagus nerve and when you stimulate the vagus nerve it goes right to the AV junction and that slows down or blocks the signal and we had a moment of ventricular standstill in which the top of the heart was working and the signal was not getting to the bottom of the heart very often and so the patient became bradycardic and the paramedic had to make a quick determination am I going to start pacing this patient or is this a temporary change? And the paramedic remained conservative and did not immediately turn on the pacer, gave it a few moments to see what's going to happen with the patient, turned up the normal saline to get that blood pressure back up, and as soon as the patient stopped vomiting, everything went back to normal. When I say normal, she's still having a STEMI, she's still going to the cath lab, uh, but you had a much more acceptable rhythm, and so it wasn't necessary to start pacing this patient right away. And that's the story of the woman who woke up feeling nauseous, went to the hospital, found out she's having a heart attack, and then during transport, because she started vomiting, changed her heart rhythm entirely, and the paramedic had to make an important decision. 
Pretty cool, huh? All right, I'll see you on the next one. Aha! Uh -huh.